Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 12 of the Good People, Bad Intentions podcast. And today I have a special guest. We have John Olhauser, who is the coach of the Crandall Boxing University team. And he is also somebody who holds a PhD and is a part-time uh, lecturer. He's also the uh, provost and VP for academic affairs at Crandall University. And he's an amateur boxer himself. So I'm really excited to have him as a guest. I was introduced to him from Sean Finnegan, a guest that we had not too long ago, uh, who's the, the captain of the team. And uh, yeah, so without further ado, everybody, let's, uh, let's talk to John. Hello, John. How's it going? I like the hat. Hey. Uh, I have to wear it. Yeah, it's if I you represent. It, I, if I don't wear it, I feel like the air conditioning's on all the time. Oh, <laughs> I uh, I think that will happen to me soon too. So, don't feel like you're alone. Ah, uh, it's kind of, you get used to it, and uh, then it feels like you're naked without it. <laughs> I I I again I I think that I actually I, I shaved my head uh, when I was in uh, middle school. Um. And I had got a really a bad, pardon? Did you lose a bet? No, I just did it for the fun of it. And uh, two two bad things happened. One thing was I got like a skin rash, like I did it improperly. And the second thing was everybody thought I was uh, thought I was uh, like uh, an extremist because I was wearing Ooh. a lot of military stuff yeah. at the same time. So yeah. But <laughs> uh, thank you so much, John, for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm happy to be here tonight. And uh, I, I understand you just came from practice. You work with you just your... finished. Yeah, we did a two hour session. So oh, wow. we're done. And uh, I think from because I had Sean on earlier, you, you guys are doing about two sessions uh, a day during the, the, the week. Yeah, that sort of works out too. We do one. I give the boys. Um, it's boys right now. I uh -huh. mean, I do want the females to join the team too, but yep. I haven't found us yet, uh -huh. uh, but yeah. So the guys do uh, one on their own. I give them in, instructions every day on what they need to do on their own, and then we do the uh, team training uh, at the other end of the day. So yeah, it works out about two a day. We try to get a rest day in there too. Hey, that that's the formula because I wanted to congratulate you on cleaning house in New York. You guys did it extremely well. I hey, think you guys yep. all. All I, one I, new just, division. I just stand at the corner and hold the water. It's the guys who do the work. That, true, true. But it's it takes two, right? And, and it's a coach that, that guides and, and, you know, helps the fighters and, and reminds them of stuff that they've learned and things that they, you know, have to do in the fight. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's really, really amazing. Um, and you represented uh, Canada Boxing really well. And... I think the main reason that I've wanted you to come on um, the podcast, besides just talking about your own journey with boxing, is how unique it is that um, you guys, Crandall University and, and the, the, the Chargers boxing team, are the only uh, collegiate or university boxing team in Canada. Is that correct? Yeah, we are. There, there are a couple of other clubs that do boxing for exercise mm -hmm. uh like trent has one and i believe it's guelph or windsor one of the other one of those two that they've got a boxer size but they don't really compete well nobody competes out of that so yeah we're the only and and none of those as well have scholarships and we have those so we're the only one that really focuses on competitions and offers scholarships and I think that's a really amazing opportunity because you see it a lot um, in the States with something like wrestling where, you know, people are able to uh, lend their skills and, and continue and, and, and study and basically con and continue also their career. And in this case, boxing is, is the state somewhere that has a lot of, do the States have university boxing teams with scholarships? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, the NCAA actually promoted uh, collegiate boxing until the mid '70s, mm -hmm. and then they had a scandal 
on not it was it didn't have really much to do with the um the sport uh some people would think that it was because it was a dangerous sport but no it had to do with scholarshiping that uh, there were somehow i don't know all of the details but there were scholarships given to whether they were pro athletes or pro boxers and and it, it became surprising right boxing there's no scandals in boxing ever <laughs> but so so ncaa moved away from it mm -hmm. and uh so in the vacuum uh the national collegiate boxing association was formed under usa boxing so it had nothing to do with ncaa and so usa boxing worked with the national collegiate boxing association and then there's also a and then of course they 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 only fight in the ring in boxing right uh, no they fight outside the ring too and there were a group of disgruntled people in the national collegiate boxing association because some of the rules or some of the restrictions so there was a breakaway group that formed the usa boxing association okay and so there are there's not as many universities associated with the usa boxing association collegiate boxing association i think there are probably half as many as there is with the national collegiate boxing association but they also because of that scandal way back in the 1970s uh they still to this day do not offer scholarships in boxing oh. and so i know nobody listens to this on the south side of the border do they but uh I think I I think there's a couple people in in Mexico. Oh, well, that's um, fine. They're they're yeah, yeah. Mexicans are fine. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, just saying the um we don't when we travel and compete in the U.S. Uh -huh. We don't make our scholarships an issue. Uh -huh. Um, so we don't we don't talk to the other teams and say, oh well, we have scholarships. No, I tell the guys if you you just talk about financial assistance, just of use course. that, and that's that's a nice cover word for it. And mm. and yeah, so and, and I say why not? I mean, these guys bust their butts, um, you know, to to train, and then they they rep Crandall. So why shouldn't they be getting some level of compensation? And well, I'm I'm happy we're able to give the scholarships that we do. Uh, because you know, whenever we travel now to shows, we're going to Alberta in three weeks. Uh, we were in New York, uh, traveling the Maritimes. I mean, we travel with, you know, the Crandall University name on the shirts. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, they they put in the time. So let's let's give them the scholarship. And you know, it was interesting because I I've been in the sport for a bit, and I I saw that. You know, I'm also an academic. I've uh, uh, earned my stripes there, and. And and I knew, I mean, you see hockey, you see football, you see basketball, volleyball, you're wrestling, swimming, you have all these sports at the universities, but boxing isn't. And so I saw an opportunity and well, <laughs> it's turning out to be a pretty good idea. I think it's a very good idea. And, and on that same lens, there seemed to be, um, at one point, most armies had um, boxing teams, but... I know with the Canadian Armed Forces, I think they've been kind of uh, backstepping a little bit on that because I was looking into that a while back, and I was told that uh, there used to be used to be a team, but not anymore. Do you know any insights about about? Because I think the Army is some somebody. The U.S. Army is somebody that you guys went against, right? Well, we we get we went against the Army's university. Okay. So. I mean, they're all enlisted. They're all, you know, uh, part of the army, but they are doing a university program as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they do, and and I'd love to get involved in this, but they do have. Uh, there's Navy has a boxing team, Army has a boxing team. I believe Air Force does in Colorado, and they do get together and compete. Uh, I'd love to be able to uh, join them, but that's kind of a closed network there unless uh, okay unless we could sneak somebody like sean in who's a canadian enlisted person but you never know yeah. and, and sean somebody i i just had on not too long ago um really special guy i see a, a really bright future with him i also have had uh aubrey mcleod on uh we were talking about him um can you talk a little bit about your experience with sean because he's uh he's a he's a 
he represents the sport really well and, and a lot of people know about him. Yeah, he and and um, I think he told I would listen to his story. Yep. He told how he how he you know came to Crandall and such. Yes. I won't repeat that. Yeah. Um, but you know, we we also I also have a team captain. Hmm. And uh, you know, we I've got a description of what a team captain is supposed to be. And you know, Sean fits that description so well that uh, I've asked him the last two years to serve as captain of a team. Okay. And uh, you know, he's he he is a leader. Um, you know, but but he, he's not the type of leader that forces himself and his ideas on anyone. But you know, if I got if I got something that needs to be done, he's the first guy to put his hand up and says, "Okay, yep, yeah, coach, I'll look after it. We'll get the guys together and we'll get her done." So, so yeah, and and, and then you know, I, all of my guys that I currently have are good at this, but especially Sean, listening, like he hears my voice you know i mean how many other coaches and and i take no credit for how he has developed as a boxer i mean i give all the kudos to to uh the guys who have coached him in the past who really helped shape him and i, I know sean has had to have the commitment and the drive mm -hmm. and he's had to put in the time for sure uh but so much uh good things have been done by his former coaches but even at that i'm just saying that when he's in a round and I yell out something from the corner for him. I see something that he has an opportunity to take or he needs to correct something. He hears me. And I go, my goodness, he just executed. I just called that out three seconds ago and he's already adjusted. And uh, to me, that is a sign of a, of a tremendous athlete who can hear that and just make the, the adjustments on the fly. So, yeah, that's why he's fun to coach. I think there's a lot of fighters, even at the top level, that don't even have that skill. And it's really important because you don't see all angles of the fight when you're in it. No. But your coach does. And well, they'll see you know. Yeah, they'll see the they'll see some some adjustments that you should make. You know, maybe you're getting hit by certain things or you should avoid certain things. And and it's no surprise um as far as the leadership thing, because uh he's he's also from my understanding, he's taken a lot of courses in the military. I'm not saying that that's the, the full reason that he has that, but he's somebody who, who has such a broad, um, you know, amount of interests um, and experiences at, at such a young age. I mean, I'm 24. I think he's 21. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like all of that experience that he's gone through, um, he's, he's a really wonderful guy. And, and everybody that I talk to about him, have nothing but good things to say about him. So it's awesome that you have him as your team captain for the last two years. Yeah, for sure. Um, absolutely. And somebody that um, I'm just, I'm just becoming aware of Adrian Roach. Um, he, he has a big story about, <laughs> about him and, and, in Ecuador. Mm. And I just saw recently that uh, you are going to be, um, one of the coaches for, uh, for Ecuador and one of these, uh, events coming up in March. Yeah, it's the, um, one, one of the first major international tournaments, you know, since the COVID dust up that mm -hmm. is, that is happening in what we'll call the Americas. So it, it will draw teams from both North, South and Central America. Um, and, uh, there's a lot of hunger out there from guys who have just been sitting on the shelf for, you know, the last two years with nothing, you know, there, there have been attempts and there've been things scheduled only for them to sort of dissolve and, and fade away. So, so yeah, it's, uh, Adrian is on the Bermuda national team and they are entering him. And, uh, they, uh, asked me, they said, you know, John, you've been working the closest with him, uh, for the last, you know, year. And uh, it is interesting because he went home here two weeks ago, same week we're in New York, he fought in Bermuda. And uh, all of the folks there were just amazed at his development. And again, I take, I take this much credit for that. And I give this much credit to him for his hard work and his study of the game and his drive and all of that. But, you know, they were very impressed with his development as an athlete. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, they they turned around and asked me to be the head coach for 
the team when it goes to Ecuador. So I'm humbled and honored and uh, looking forward to the trip to Ecuador. That's, that's an amazing opportunity and an honor. And uh, yes. did you have a chance at looking at the documentary that he was uh, featured in? He was one of, uh, I think, three? Yeah, there, there, there was a documentary from two years ago. Mm-hmm. They started, the documentary started following two boxers. You know, the whole idea was, you know, Bermuda hasn't had success in the Olympics since the Montreal Olympics in 76. Okay. And so the story was there were these two boxers that really held promise. And uh, when, when COVID hit and came around, these two guys, they said, look, we're getting older. We can't wait for COVID to settle down. We just missed an Olympics. So we're going to, you know, strike out and go pro. And, uh, and so they thought, well, who do we have left? coming up through the system and there was this young guy adrian and so he's sort of now been given the mantle from his country to say adrian we want to invest in you and we have, believe you have promise and uh, we're hoping that uh and the 2024 olympics you'll bring hardware home for bermuda so i i get just a tiny little bit of contribution into uh that journey for him and and they're actually doing hey they're going to re-release or i shouldn't say re-release they're doing a whole new documentary and they just filmed part of it on a trailer that uh, they released here uh on new year's day uh for him in his now continued journey to 2024 wow that's amazing that there's that story and that he's kind of uh you know carrying the torch for his country Um, and, you know, and hope, and it's really cool that you're also going to be a part of that as far as, you know, with the, the coaching side and then also, um, you know, helping the national team. Um, yeah, you know, that, that's, you know, I'm just a little boxing coach in New Brunswick and, uh, to just be given the opportunity, I'm, I'm thrilled and honored and, and, uh, you know, we're going to Ecuador and I told Bermuda, I said, our goal is to come back as winners. So that's, that's what we're going down to do. And what was it like, uh, kind of your first experience meeting him? Like, uh, did, did, so he's, did he move all the way from Ecuador to Canada for, for study and for boxing? No, no, he's from Bermuda. Uh, sorry, Bermuda. Yeah. Yeah. So the first time I met him and his parents, uh, was actually in 2020 in the springtime on a zoom call. And, uh, His parents really believe in him as an athlete, but they also want him to get an education. Uh And uh, so they, we were introduced by zoom. I told them the story and they said together as a family, we're going to do this. So the first semester he was at Crandall Mm -hmm. was the fall of 20, uh, 2020 and everything was online. So, so we, we had him online from Bermuda (laughs) <laughs> he worked at a restaurant as well so some of uh, i there was one class or one course that i taught and he was in it and uh, he would always uh, be in the back storage room of the restaurant uh in class i could see dishes and and uh, food supplies around him but uh so and then he came in january of 21 uh at the same time we also had recruited a, a young boxer from cyprus uh, and the two of them, we put up at the time you could do this. I don't think you could do it today, but at the time we could actually put them in a cottage. We put them uh, just off Shediac, uh in a cottage together and they did their isolation for two weeks and, uh, uh, and then they came out and that's when I first met him for the very first time and shook his hand. That must have been a surreal moment because you, you get to, you get to meet somebody, you know, online or whatnot. And then, have that that moment where you get to actually meet in person and then finally, you know, get onto the objective as far as the boxing and in-person training. Yeah. Uh, that's again, as I've been saying, like, this is awesome um, that, that you have such, such uh, wonderful, interesting people, part of your team. Well, yeah, and Matt, it, it's, it's, it, I, I'm on the, you know, I'm in the front seat of this. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I work with these guys every day um, and they're, 
their character as a team is unbelievable, tight. And now I have, I mean, one of the things we get to do as a university is we get to represent Canada at the uh, uh, World University Boxing Championships this coming fall. It's in Russia, so we'll be traveling there. But in order to represent us well as a nation, I've recruited across the weight classes. So I don't have a whole bunch of guys, you know, sort of grouped into one weight. They're spread all over. So they have no problem knowing that when we go to a show, we've got a guy at, uh, you know, 57, we've got a guy at 69, we've got a guy at 75, we've got a guy, and, and they're tight and they cheer for each other and they are, I mean, they motivate and push each other. It's just, you know, everybody talks about boxing being the loneliest sport. You probably heard that. Of course. And, yeah. and, and you know, and there's a lot of truth to that because you got to put in your time. You got to do your road work. You got to, you know, you, you, but our experience here is this thing isn't lonely. These guys are, there. there's something about, working together on a biology course and then you go off to history and and so you're working at your academics together but then you're training together and it's not a lonely place these guys are the, they're biggest fans of each other and they encourage each other they hold each other accountable it it's yeah you're in the ring by yourself but this is a team uh there's no doubt about it my favorite thing has been like uh, Sean Hill or a couple of the team members. They'll like put on their story at like six a.m. They'll like see somebody at the gym and they're like, "Hey, and they're," you know, they kind of have that, uh, like you said, accountability and and yeah. teamwork and encouraging each other. So uh, that's yeah. I think what you touched on uh, is really really interesting because. Um, there's actually like an Instagram, it's called the loneliest sport. And it, it tries to show the, you know, the, the individual aspect about boxing, but certainly there's all these different factors that motivate us. And a lot of times, you know, people, and it can be, can be the biggest motivators, especially, you know, kind words to one, each one another, encouraging each other, teaching stuff that, you know, maybe they don't know. Cause I'm sure, you know, everybody that's a part of your team is from different walks of life and, uh, you know, have strengths, have weaknesses and, and together as, you know, as a team, they can work on all that. Absolutely. And now I want to move the, the conversation more towards you in the sense of where did your journey into boxing begin? Because I know you're, you were saying that you are an academic. Um, so you, you uh, are have a, a place at Crandall University. Yes, I do. Yeah, and I'm. Yeah, my my title at Crandall. I've been here since 2016, uh, the start of that year. Uh, I'm uh, the provost and the vice president for academic affairs. So I'm more of an administrator, although I do teach as well in the area of uh, communication and. Uh, and not for profit management, so I do that as well. Um, but um, yeah, it's I mean, growing up, I I chuckle on this. I don't think there's a link, but I suppose if I had our psychologists sit down with me, they'd probably say no. There is a link to this. I I was a hockey player growing up. Okay. And but I was a goaltender. So two things about goaltenders, they're weird. Okay. So the first thing they're the the weirdest people on on the on the whole team, <laughs> and number two is they often don't get to be involved in scraps, so they're often an instigator. But you know, if they instigate something, it's usually the defensemen that take over. Uh, you know, and they say you're not going to, you know, touch our goaltender, and and so you get there and say, well, okay, I started the fight, but I'm not finishing it. <laughs> So, so I don't know. I don't know if there was something latent in uh, me as a goaltender. From uh, I, I played all the way up to university hockey in the U.S. Oh, but wow. uh, then, you know, middle age. I'm. I've got um, kids. One daughter who's 15, and she says to me, "Dad, 
uh, I really am interested in the RCMP as a career. And I said, okay, fantastic. Let's go and talk to the recruiter and let's see what you should do as a 15 year old, what courses you should take, what you know, the other things you should do. And so they, they gave her a whole bunch of things, but on the list was, you know, you should enroll in a combat sport. <laughs> okay, dad, I've done karate. I don't want to do karate anymore. I'd like to do boxing, but I'm a 15 year old girl and I'm nervous to go into a gym. I don't know how I'll be, would you go with me? And so I was 45 at the time. And I said, well, I'm kind of interested in it, and, but I'm not going to go and sit in the parking lot and wait for your session to be done. I, you know, I'll at least go in and see what kind of exercise this is like. All the while sort of having in, in the back of my mind from long ago when I was maybe 20 thinking, oh, it would be love to compete in a combat sport like boxing. But after a month, I was in good shape. I was keeping up with all the 20 year olds. And I thought, okay, if I'm, if I'm keeping up, I can put in the rounds, I can run like these guys. I said to my coach, does anybody my age of 45 ever compete? And they said, well, there's not a lot, but we, we can put you on that track. So I've been, I'm gonna take out COVID. So in the last eight years then, I've had 23 fights. Oh, wow. And uh, the first 18 of those 23 were done in Alberta. Mm -hmm. and I don't know, is it Alberta? I mean, we're seeing it now with all of these trucker protests or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Alberta is Alberta. So they actually put me in the ring with 20 year olds. Wow. Like you're not supposed to, you know, boxing Canada, the master's rules, you're, you're supposed to only fight guys over 40 and within 10 years of your age. Okay. Well, I don't know if I impressed them or if they were crazy or what. I remember going to the very first, very first show and uh i pulled up i'd never done this and my coach was caught in a snowstorm so he wasn't there and it was way ins and so i said well i'm the last guy in the room i better go check in and so i walked up to the uh, person at the desk and she said all oh, coaches are over there i said well i'm not a coach i'm actually in the show and she just about fell off her chair and she said okay uh and i didn't win that one i lost the split decision but but um I just loved it. And I remember, Matt, every morning, you know, it doesn't happen anymore. Although, I'll tell you, I was supposed to fight in New York on our trip here, but my opponent really? came in overweight, so they wouldn't let us go. But back in, you know, when I'm in the 47, 46, I, every day, every day, I would wake up and the first thing I would look at was my cell phone to see if there was a text from my coach saying that he had matched me for a fight. Wow. Every day. He was just saying, okay, maybe, oh, no, nothing today. Okay, I'll keep waiting. Uh, you know, it just gets in your blood and it's weird, but that was, you know, where I was at. That That's actually very, um, that's very good of you to, uh, you know, try and support your, your daughter and, and, and I can't imagine what it's like to be a 15 year old girl wanting to walk into a, uh, a boxing gym for the first as, time. Yeah. 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 And we certainly have been getting from, from I've had uh Sierra excuse day and I've had uh Stacia, the natural uh, subtles on, and I've had a few um, females on, on the show already. And I've always asked them the question about what is it like uh, being a female? in a predominantly male dominated sport. And I can't imagine what it's like um, to be a female going into a gym. Maybe it's getting a little bit better, but I can tell you one thing is that it's probably a lot better when you get somebody like your dad, somebody that, you know, that's, that's behind you, that's supporting you. So that's awesome that you were willing and open-minded enough to go in there with her. Cause I'm sure you both benefited from, from going there, right? This is something that's, uh, you know, a big part of your life. Yeah. She, she did one competition and she's happy she did it, but then that was it. Okay. And, I mean, that's what happens with a lot of people. They'll, they'll, they'll set a goal. I want to try this, but then when they're done, they're saying, I'm glad I did, but that's all I need. Uh, for me, I'm still looking. <laughs> <laughs> I just turned 56 last week. So. Oh, 
Happy belated yeah. birthday. Thank you. And the follow-up question is, uh, did she end up uh, joining the RCMP? No, she didn't. Okay. Uh, she has, she had an eye issue <laughs> that uh, required her surgery in order for her to qualify for it. And the, the eye surgeon, because it was some, she's technically legally blind, although she's, you know, she still drives and things, but the, the um, surgery is not guaranteed. And, and it also is not guaranteed if it did work for actually to stay for more than three or four years. So she's decided, no, she's going to work in a different line of, of work and decided, you know, no use, no use keeping you know, down that path when it, it didn't look like it was going to materialize. Well, I, I give her kudos for having a vision at 15. And yeah. unfortunately, I also am like legally blind without glasses. So I can totally understand, like I can drive, I, I box without my glasses on. I don't know how I, I tell people all the time. I'm like, good thing. I don't have to like read fine print or anything while I'm punching somebody. Right. But, uh, but yeah, like, the RCMP, I, I don't 100% know. I, I mean, maybe there are reasons, but they're very strict. They're more strict than the, the army yeah. Um, in a lot of ways. So, and it used to be they had like height requirements and this or that. Like they, uh, they had their own vision about what it's like to be uh, law enforcement in Canada. Yes. I, thought, I thought it was just like he rode horses or something, but no, they <laughs> no. Well, she, she also found, she did a number of ride-alongs and okay. uh, she also, that helped. I think that didn't help because she saw how much paperwork there was to do <laughs> that, you know, it doesn't matter any, any incident, you have reams and reams and reams of reports to file. And she said, do I really want to do that for the rest of my life? I don't know. And all the disorderly conduct you have to deal with and you have to write it down. Like he yeah. said this and you're like, Oh, yeah. I don't even want to think about what he said. And now I have to, you know, yeah. make uh, photocopies for the whole entire, you know, uh, uh, RCMP headquarters. So that's awesome. Um, so, so, okay. So you've, you've competed quite a bit and you also, I, I didn't know that. So you were going to, you were going to compete uh, also, which is, Hey, you're not just, you're not just the, the general that's going into war from behind. You're going there to the front. You're also going to, you know, lead the team as far as uh, competing yourself, which is really awesome. Um, well, it's, it's, I, I, every time I do it, Matt, I do it with mixed feelings. Okay. Because I want to be in there. Every time I see my guys fight and I see the pictures after, I just about, I'd say, oh, I wish I was me. I, I want to be in there. But at the same time, I have to remember now that I've been given the responsibility of coach. Mm -hmm. And I, I did it in, in New York because I was confident in the guys I was taking. And I had arranged so that the, 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 that, I would fight, but there would be a number of fights that would happen after until my first opportunity to coach, because I've done it before where I've been on a show with one of my, with one of my fighters that I'm coaching. And I don't think I was there 100% for them as a coach, because I was thinking about my own game. I was thinking, okay, he's fighting before me. Um, okay. I can get in there. I can watch him, but I'm also thinking about preparing for my own time in the ring. And so I, I don't, I, boy, I want to do it. Like I'll go to the Brampton cup because I know that they, they push us masters off to the end. So all my coaching is done by that, by then. Uh, but I really have to be careful that I don't commit to a fight where it, it takes away from what I have to offer my guys as a coach. So it rips me because uh, I want to be in there too, but I say, ah, but I got to be their coach. I got to be there for them a hundred percent. 
this um what what you're describing really uh reminds me of something that my coach bridget which uh she said hi by the way bridget stevens oh. at tribal um something that she said because uh she's also a fighter turned coach um and and she had to kind of transition not to her uh own desire at the time she had a i believe it was a jaw injury and it was very hard for her um it's a little in some ways it's a little bit different than what you're saying but then in other ways it's similar she had a hard time seeing her fighters fight because she wanted to be the person that was there herself and and competing still and 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 going about her goals and then now um i think she's reached a point now where she's able to be content with the fact that her fighters are the ones that are getting the attention and more so than that she's finding it a lot and maybe you agree with this it's a lot harder when it's your fighter that's in the ring as far as you know your nerves and everything like that than maybe even if you were fighting do you do you have that kind of sense yourself or is it still more nerve-wracking fighting yourself yeah, I, I think I still have the higher sense of, of adrenaline and uh, I'll say, yeah, it's nervousness. It's funny though, Matt, I don't know, and Bridget might say the same thing. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I, any fight, I've got, I've got butterflies until the first step inside the ring, the first step through the ropes, it's like it just sheds right there. It's just gone. It doesn't follow me into the ring. As soon as I'm standing in there, I'm like, where did the nerves go? This is going to be fun. I'm going to win this. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really weird. It's just, you step through and it's like this thing just sheds off you and it stays on the apron on the outside. I, I have not had the experience to fight yet, but I've had the experience of actually being a pro corner man ah. at the, uh, the, it was one of the Ryan Riziki cards in Cape Breton, the, the, valentine's day massacre i believe it was in okay. 2019 20 it was just before the pandemic so is that 2019 or 2020 that would have been 2019 okay yeah february yeah. 2019 mm -hmm. and i remember it wasn't obviously me fighting but i tried to you know comfort my fighter and everything like that and i helped them whatever prepare i was walking into the ring i fell and uh i actually oh. cut cut my finger uh, oh, no. and then in between like i wore these new timbaland boots i thought i looked so cool i never wore like timbaland or like construction boots ever in my life so i learned right then and there you got to have like comfortable clothes when you're actually cornering and uh in the fight only went two rounds we were against the debut fighter josh prince and uh basically when i was giving him water there was blood all over the water bottle. He's like, what happened? And I was like, oh, it's actually me. I fell like the, blood, the blood's all over your water bottle. He won, right? He actually didn't get any blood on. The, the biggest loss of blood was, was me. But I do remember when I, when I stepped in there on that show, because it was a pro card, and maybe the AMs have it this way too, the lights, when they hit you, it's like there's a, a heat and a weight. Yep. Um, and the crowd, like everybody was there from Cape Breton waiting for Riziki. And uh, when when uh, my fighter had uh, knocked down his opponent, the, 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 the noise and how it pierces you. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you're able to put that uh, away once you get through the ropes because I was just thinking to myself, if I was ever in that situation, man, it's there's nothing like it. It's like... Uh, supernatural event happening oh i mean the rush is is tremendous but it, yeah and i don't know why it happens there's just i step through the ropes and there's just the sense of yeah this is where i'm supposed to be yeah what's the big deal let's just go to work and and that's that's awesome too when you were describing like your eagerness because i think there are a lot of people especially now with there being a lot of cancellations and hopefully none in the future but there had been in the past uh, yeah knock on wood my 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 desk is made out of wood mine's uh, arborite it doesn't count okay <laughs> um but yeah like i think a lot of people can relate to that eagerness as far as they want them wanting to start their career or, or continue their career 
they amb- have ambitions for the Olympics, maybe, or some form of competition, uh, maybe to become a pro someday. And uh, uh, when I had Sierra on actually yesterday, she was talking about the fact that three of the nationals uh, for her, I don't know if it's all nationals or if it was just for her particular uh, age group have been canceled. So she has not able to been, she has not been able to make the national team the last three years. I think the only hope that she said she had was something around youth under 18 um, for some type of other tournament. Um, But yeah, it's been a lot of uh, red lights for a lot of people. And I guess one thing I want to ask you is um, because I'm sure you've, you've had a lot of fighters that have come to you about this. Is there, when, when, when you're getting a lot of red lights, is there any mental things or, or ways of, of, about still looking towards the positive side or continuing with your boxing? I mean, I think that's, you know, we talked about boxing being the loneliest sport. You know, mm-hmm. that, that's where it becomes the most difficult. You know, you've got to say, and that's where I really see the real boxer from the person who thinks they're wanting to be a boxer because a real boxer will say yeah my day will come I've got to keep at this I've got to keep sharp I have to take my opportunities I'm looking around sparring different people um yeah and and you know to me that's where I as a coach see you know that person over there even though you know we're shut down and we're in isolation man they're still you know, on the road, they're still running, they're still doing their pull-ups on that monkey bar in the school ground, because there's no other place to go, Um, and they don't have a scheduled opponent, they don't have a scheduled fight now, but they, they're still there putting in their time as though they're fighting this weekend. And Sean, Sean, when I was talking to him, uh, and and you know this more than me, he took up cross-country, eh? I don't know if it was the chicken or the egg, but uh, he started yeah. doing cross country and he, and he, he did re- place really well in some races. We, when, when he started uh, with Crandall, we had another boxer here from Mexico. Okay. And uh, Marvick was the, he had the, he had the most interesting gait as a runner, but he could run like the wind. And uh, so we, so Sean started and then we'd have them go out and, you know, do sprints with each other. And they, again, they push each other. Okay. They're competitors. And, uh, and so Marvick really got Sean kind of introduced to this running thing. And then Marvick was on the cross country team and uh, Sean got involved with it, but then COVID happens and Marvick went home to Mexico and didn't come back. But Sean said, Hey, I'm going to stick with this. And, well, my goodness, he sure helped our team this year win a, a maritime uh, championship. So he's a uh, he's a superman. Yeah, and and have you seen just as a coach? Because I was talking to him, and and you tend to see like endurance play a huge factor in the pros more than the amateurs. I mean, certainly, like you can speed tends to be the a big factor when the amateurs with only the three rounds, but. Have you seen a difference in his athletic ability because of doing this extra curricular in, in running? Has he been able to endure more or? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to embarrass him and he'll laugh at this and he'll, yeah, yeah. He'll, he'll, one of the first training sessions I took him through when he first, you know, was coming to Crandall, it was still nice weather. So we were working outside and uh, I remember it was, I don't know, two thirds of the way through the session. And uh, I said, what? I'm thought, why is Sean over in the bushes? <laughs> he was over there throwing up. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I said, oh, okay, I'm good. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being too soft on him. <laughs> we're, we're making him work. But you know what? I've never got him close to that since. Uh, and so I think that's you know, all of his output. And I think he looked at that and he said, no, that isn't where I wanna be. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, I, I do, you know, that's one thing I think it's a little bit different than, 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 um, you know, a, a lot of community clubs 
are organized to offer a boxing experience and skill. But again, you're you're on an, any particular evening, you're running, you know, all the way from age seven to, you know, 40 or whatever it is, and you've got different levels of skills, different interests. And then people are buying memberships and they're coming in for their one hour session and then their two hour session. And you just, you don't have time to work a lot on the conditioning side of things. And then you, you, you tell the, those who are competitive, yeah, you've got to do your conditioning stuff, and, but you got to do it on your own. But I build that right in here to our program. And, and so, you know, when, when Sean, when I drove Sean to <laughs> end up throwing in the bush or throwing up in the bushes, I know he said that's not where I want to be with John, and so, you know, he just put in, he just picked it up, and you know, I haven't gotten him anywhere close to. At least he doesn't tell me anywhere close to throwing up again. Sean, Sean just so just... you know, just so you're not embarrassed, uh, we actually are going to put a plaque at that bush, and that bush <laughs> is going to have a name, and every student or everybody in the local area that walks by there, this is where the great Sean Finnegan you know, tested his limits and yeah. never shall he again uh, have any of his vomit on the, <laughs> the bush. Yeah. That's an awesome story. Cause uh, yeah, like um, I've, I've obviously talked to him a lot. Um, Cause I thought I was going to join the army for a while at, at Ormocto, uh and I was following him and, and Ormocto and, and, and New Brunswick in general, too, has a huge history of boxing. Yeah. Um, and it's really interesting that, that, you know, Crandall is also able to be a part of that chapter because I don't know if you know any, uh, Yvonne Durrell, the fighting fisherman. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's somebody that my grandfather used to talk about all the time. And mm -hmm. I didn't know too much, obviously, about him. And then I find out he has these this crazy war with Archie Archie Moore, and that he's he had the same trainer uh, Goldman as uh, Rocky Marciano, and I'm like all of a sudden I'm like wow, you know, uh, we we have a, a very rich history, uh, you know, Atlantic Canada, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, however you want to look at it, and it's really awesome that the new the next generation whether they're from here or they're just coming here for study and, and being a part of, of the team. It's, it's awesome that the next op, the next generation has this opportunity to also learn and, and work on their academic skills so that they not only have the boxing skills that they want to develop, but they also have, you know, the, the life skills. Yeah. And, career and I skills. don't have any doubt, Matt, that some of these guys are really going to do something with the sport, but I tell them, you know, when, when, when we're doing the recruitment pitch and I'm explaining to them, I said, you know, success in the ring for us and for me is important. I mean, we want to win and we're not just going in there for an experiment and for a, you know, walk around the, you know, squared circle. Uh, we're going in to win. We're going in to fight hard. But I said, success in the ring is important, but success in life is more important. I said, uh, you know, I want you to have success in your academics. I want you to have success in your relationships. I want you to have success, you know, emotionally, uh, you know, and success in all of these aspects, not just physically in your ability as a boxer. And, you know, and, and we, we can also, we also add unapologetically, we say, we want you to be successful spiritually too. You know, we want you to wear however that is. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we, we give that, that holistic approach i like to say guys how are your relationships going either with your roommate or your significant other or you know whatever it is your parents uh you know those are those are important for you you know uh you know how about mentally how are your classes going you know you know are you you're getting by i can you know, we've got helps around here let's be sure we'd be successful there as well and and um, you know if um if it's you know important for you then spiritually as well so we've got helps and opportunities to grow there too and that's that's beyond just boxing. Yep. I think that is the right way to go about it because now they're able to focus on the boxing because they have all these other things already looked after, right? If you have, you know, a bad relationship, you know, how often do those things uh, impact, you know, your day to day things? They 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 can, right? So that's awesome that that's kind of 
um, at least understood that these things are, are important and should be, uh, you know, dealt with. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we are getting uh, close to time. And I've I really appreciated you coming on to the show. Certainly had a lot to talk about. Uh, kind of in closing, um, what's the most re- the most upcoming thing that that you're working towards, or that people that are listening can help support? Um, is there is there ways that that can help support the the team at Crandall University and everything you guys are doing? Because I'm sure there's people that are listening and maybe they have some some kids that they want to get into boxing. They're like, oh, this is an awesome avenue in the future. How can they support you guys? Yeah, I mean, if that's at what level of, of support. I mean, we've got some great shows coming up um, to cheer on, but but you know, if there's a if there's a kid there who happens to tune in and who's 15 or 16 years old, um, I didn't do that. I mean, when you're the only game in town, Matt. You end up getting, I mean, how many guys out of 11 that I have on my team now are on their national teams? I mean, I think it's five or six. Um, it's, it's the, the team, un, until there are other university teams in the area or in Canada, you know, I, I'm going to have some fairly deep talent on this team. But so, so a kid who says, hey, I want to do that. You know, I'm 15. I've got two or three years of high school left. Now, I want to be on that university team. I want to have those experiences. I want to get that scholarship. You know, it's not impossible, but you got to bust your butt. I mean, you got to put in, you got to shoot, you got to be at least shoot for a provincial championship. Um, and and you got to get your 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 fight counts up. I said, you know, somebody who comes to me and said says, well, you know, John, I've got three fights. Uh, on my record, you know, is it good enough to join the team? And I'd go, if I had a junior varsity team, sure, but I don't. I only have the varsity team, and unless you're an open fighter, it'll be really tough to. And I hope everybody knows what that is. Open fighter, you got ten or more fights. Um, I think it'll be tough to break in and and make it on the team, but but it's possible. It's still, I mean, I'm I'm still in conversation with two guys from the Maritimes yet for this coming fall, who have the record and the skill and the ability. And I hope that uh, I see them wearing a Crandall jersey come September. But uh, um, so so there's that, yeah. I was going to say, uh, maybe for your, I might have a solution for your problems with uh, other universities not competing. Maybe you just got to stir the pot a little bit, you know, go to some of the universities and start, you know, uh, doing some friendly wagers or whatnot. You get some, some well, other academics who want to uh, maybe who have a, a boxing background that want to, to, to feed into, you know, across Canada uh, boxing. boxing well, I know, I know we're, we're almost out of time, but I'll say two yeah. things. Uh, first of all, uh, both UNB and Acadia um, show, showed an initial about two years ago. Oh, we should do that. And I'm saying, yeah, I'll help you. Wow. Well, that was the end of this. That was about it. That's about as uh, far as it got. Uh, uh, if you, if but, somebody's listening and they're in university, yeah. maybe write a letter, write a letter yeah. and try to get your university. Yeah. No, to get a and, box. and and you can have their, you know, you and B, you know, whoever can reach out to us and say, how did you do it? Help us get going. Yeah. Love to help you get going. But the other thing is we go to the uh, University World Championships. Uh, mm-hmm. I told you we're going to be in Russia. Yes. Uh, that organization, which is uh, the Federation of uh, University uh, Sports, is the host of that. They're actually working with the, and they just announced it three weeks ago, they're working with the International Boxing Association to, de- to enhance and develop a more robust university boxing program worldwide. Okay. And uh, and so I told U Sport, I told Boxing Canada, I said, yeah, we're ready as Crandall University. We're ready to do the heavy lifting to make that happen in Canada. We'd love to see a Western division 
a central division and an eastern division. And uh, you know, if there's three or four universities in each one of those, you have your own divisional uh, tournaments. And then the winners of that come together to a national tournament. And then the winners of that national tournament are the ones that get to go to this world university championship. Because right now it's just us. So anybody I recruit, and that's why I'm very picky on this talent because this is an IABA tournament I mean, it is high end. So I'm not going to take a guy there with three fights. I mean, he'll be, he'll die. <laughs> I'm thinking too, I, I'm really interested to see the, the Russian competition. Cause uh, yeah. you know, it'd be, I was talking with, uh, with Sean, just as a closing, like, and, and I've talked with every uh, also Sierra and I've talked with, uh, I don't think I've talked about Stacia with this yet. But, uh, you know, who's been the toughest competition that you face? And, and they both uh, – actually, it was Sierra that said uh, in Hawaii, but Sean said in Ireland because in Ireland they t- tend to, to choose more lanky fighters for the weight division and know how to use their, their reach and whatnot. But mm-hmm. uh, I'm always – I'm interested once a fighter has experience with all the different uh, countries – because a lot of countries have different uh, coaching styles and different fighting styles. Of course, the Cubans and Russians, et cetera. Uh, I'd be really interested after that event, um, you know, going against all these different uh, countries, what uh, kind of what your, what your feel is for, for all of them. Well, we, uh, we will have fun. And uh, our goal is to come home with some hardware. And uh, when you said hardware, I was thinking like, oh, like some appliances, you know, like, yeah, a, yeah like, <laughs> oh, I'll take this fridge home with me. Yeah, sure. No, no, some metals, of course. Yes. That's, well, you, you've certainly proven it just recently that you can bring some hardware. So I'm hoping on the world stage that this also happens. Well, we, we would do, we'll want to represent Canada well and Crandall and New Brunswick. Hey, I I really appreciate your time coming on here, chatting, uh, you know, sharing your story, sharing, you know, what what you're working on, what your fighters are working on. I think it's awesome what you guys are doing. That's why I wanted to have you on. Uh, You know, I think you're making history. uh, So please keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll have you on in the future once there's some, some more updates, some more fights. Yeah. Very good. I, I would uh, look forward to the invitation, Matt. Thank you for the invitation for tonight. All right. And as always, stay safe and take care. And you as well. Thanks. Take care. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to this episode of the podcast. I really had a good time talking with John. I think there was a lot of interesting things that we talked about. The main thing, though, is I think it was a really cool insight about the kind of team aspect and how um, the team members of Crandall University Boxing Club um, motivate each other because, as we've already known, uh, boxing is known as one of the most loneliest sports because of the individual aspects, mentally, physically, that have to go in to the sport. And to hear that refreshing take about how people can help and motivate each other uh, was really refreshing. So I hope everybody has taken some uh, important lessons from our conversation today. And I also wanted to remind anybody that hasn't already, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel or on your preferred podcast platform. So that way, when a new episode comes out, you're the first person to listen. And as always, guys, stay safe. Have a good rest of your day, whatever time you're listening to it. And we'll catch you on the flip side. Take care.